herzlich willkommen zu unserer ersten ausschließlich digitalen Veranstaltung des Memoriums Nürnberger Prozesse. Mein Name ist Rebecca Weiß, ich bin wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin hier am Memorium und ich freue mich sehr, Sie hier heute begrüßen zu dürfen zu einer ganz spannenden Veranstaltung, ähm, bei der wir gleich ein ganz großartiges Buch präsentieren können, nämlich das neue Buch von Philipp Sands, die Rattenlinie, ein Nazi auf der Flucht. Der Autor selbst wird uns bei dieser Veranstaltung unterstützen, ebenso wie die großartige Künstlerin Katja Riemann. Bevor wir jetzt aber richtig loslegen mit der Veranstaltung, noch ein paar organisatorische Hinweise. Ähm, wir bitten Sie, während der gesamten Veranstaltung Ihre Mikrofone ausgeschaltet zu lassen. Zusätzlich möchte ich Sie darauf hinweisen, dass die Veranstaltung aufgezeichnet wird. Es kann also sein, dass Sie in der Aufzeichnung zu sehen sind. Ähm, ich würde Sie deswegen bitten, schalten Sie doch Ihre Kamera aus, wenn Sie das nicht möchten. Auch noch ein kleiner Tipp am Rande. Wenn es Sie das Gefühl haben, das Internet kommt nicht mehr ganz hinterher und es fängt an zu ruckeln, dann schalten Sie doch auch Ihre Kamera aus. Das spart normalerweise Daten. Ansonsten würde ich Ihnen auch empfehlen, in Ihrer Ansicht die Sprecheransicht auszuwählen. So können Sie immer diejenige Person sehen, die spricht. Ähm, des Weiteren noch der Hinweis, ähm, am Ende der Veranstaltung können Fragen gestellt werden. Ich bitte Sie dafür, ausschließlich die Chat-Funktion zu benutzen. Die sehen Sie unten in Ihrem Bildschirm mit einer kleinen Sprechblase ausgestattet. Und Sie können die Fragen gerne auf Deutsch oder auf Englisch stellen, sollten Sie eine Frage an Philipp Sands haben und diese auf Deutsch stellen, übernehme ich die Übersetzung für Sie sehr gerne. Ähm, ich werde dann diese Fragen auch am Ende der Veranstaltung vorlesen und den Protagonistinnen stellen. Ansonsten freue ich mich sehr, Ihnen jetzt die Protagonisten des Abends vorstellen zu dürfen. Als erstes den Autoren Philipp Sands, er selbst ist Professor, Autor und Völkerrechtler und ist eng und seit vielen Jahren mit dem Memorium Nürnberger Prozesse verbunden. Schon im Januar 2016 konnten wir den Film ähm, A Nazi Legacy, What Our Fathers Did, im historischen Saal 600 zeigen, ähm, bei dem auch der Regisseur David Evans und die beiden Protagonisten Niklas Frank und Horst von Wächter anwesend waren. Von den beiden werden wir sicher heute Abend noch einiges zu hören bekommen. Außerdem konnten wir auch schon Philipp Sands vorhergehendes Buch Rückkehr nach Lemberg 2018 im historischen Saal 600 präsentieren, damals auch schon unterstützt von Katja Riemann. Und ich versuche sie auch so ein bisschen mitzunehmen in den historischen Saal 600. Sie sehen ihn hier im Hintergrund, obwohl wir leider dort uns im Moment nicht versammeln können. Ich freue mich auch an dieser Stelle, Katja Riemann vorzustellen, obwohl ich mir sicher bin, ich brauche es gar nicht unbedingt zu tun, denn viele kennen sie. Sie ist eine der bekanntesten deutschen Schauspielerinnen, bekannt aus Filmen wie Die Rosenstraße oder Die drei Teile von Fuck die Goethe. Ähm, sie wurde auch für ihre schauspielerische Leistung mit mehreren Preisen ausgezeichnet, zum Beispiel einem Bambi oder auch einem adolf Grimme preis Sie ist aber auch für ihr menschenrechtliches Engagement bekannt und ähm, unterstützt unter anderem Plan International und Amnesty International. Ebenso ist sie sehr mit diesem Buch, das, um das es heute Abend geht, ähm, verbunden. Sie hat oh, tatsächlich sehr viel mitgearbeitet, auch an der Hörbuchversion, der englischen Version und kennt sich hervorragend mit diesem Thema aus. Und beim Thema bleiben wir auch gleich, denn tatsächlich passt dieses Buch thematisch sehr, sehr gut zu den Nürnberger Prozessen, auch wenn man das auf den ersten Blick vielleicht gar nicht vermuten würde. Die Rattenlinie, ein Nazi auf der Flucht, beschäftigt sich nämlich mit einem mutmaßlichen Kriegsverbrecher, den man nicht vor Gericht gestellt hat. Und das beleuchtet tatsächlich einen Aspekt, der sonst relativ wenig in den Vordergrund gerückt wird. Denn häufig geht es um diejenigen Personen, die in den 13 Nürnberger Prozessen angeklagt waren, aber wesentlich weniger um diejenigen, die nicht vor Gericht gestellt werden konnten aus unterschiedlichsten Gründen. Und das Buch erzählt auf ganz beeindruckende Weise die Geschichte von ähm, Otto Wächter und gibt Einblicke in die Frage, wieso es eigentlich nicht möglich war, so viele Personen, die man gesucht hatte, auch vor Gericht zu stellen. Und aus diesem Grund haben wir uns auch entschieden, diese Buchvorstellung im Rahmen des 75. Jahrestags des Beginns der Nürnberger Prozesse 
zu, aufzunehmen und zu zeigen. Vielleicht sagt Ihnen ähm, dieser Jahrestag auch etwas. Am 20. November 2020, vor knapp zwei Wochen, ähm, hat im historischen Saal 600 ein Erinnerungsakt stattgefunden, zu dem auch zum Beispiel der Bundespräsident ähm, Frank-Walter Steinmeier extra nach Nürnberg gekommen war. Ich möchte aber jetzt gar nicht weiter ähm, aufhalten und ich übergebe hiermit gleich mal an den Autoren. Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca. And may I begin by apologizing that I can't speak to you in German. I wish that I could. Um, I'll say a little bit about how we're going to proceed. Uh, I want to begin uh, by thanking you all for joining this evening and in particular to thank the Memoriam. It's a place that I've come to know well. Uh, as Rebecca said, I was there uh, last week, uh, 10 days ago, uh, with President Steinmeier and Uh, the mayor and with various other colleagues, and that was a, a wonderful privilege um, for me. Uh, I also want to thank um, my wonderful publishing house in Germany, uh, Fischer Verlag, and my fine editor, Tanja Hommen, and all the colleagues uh, in uh, Fischer for translating so beautifully uh, the German edition. The book came out in English in uh, April. It came out also in Dutch in April. Uh, in French last month, and now German is the fourth language. And for obvious reasons, it's a very important language uh, for me. Uh, and also, finally, I want to thank my dear friend, Katja Riemann, who you will be meeting uh, very shortly, who will be reading some extracts from the book um, in uh, the German. It has been, I'm told, magnificently translated. And I'm going to say a little bit more about the circumstances of the translation in a minute, because the act of translation has been extremely complex and beautifully done. We're going to have, I think, three uh, readings over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, but let me just begin by telling you how I wrote this book uh, to explain um, how it was that I came to focus on the Wächters. About 10 years ago, I received an invitation to give a lecture in the city of Lemberg, Uh, which today is Lviv in Ukraine. And I accepted to give an invitation on the cases that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide, including crimes tried in Nuremberg's courtroom 600, because my grandfather, Leon Buchholz, was born in uh, Lemberg in 1904. He never talked to me about it, and I wanted to find the house where he was born. I went to Lemberg. I found the house where my grandfather was born. But I also discovered something else that surprised me. The inventors of the legal concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide, Hirsch Lauterpacht and Raphael Lemkin, both came from Lemberg. They were both students at the university that had invited me. And the university people today at the university in Lviv, as it now is, the law faculty, did not know that the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity could be traced to not only the city, but to the law faculty at the university in that city. And so I started writing a book about three men, my grandfather, Leon, the Cambridge professor, Hirsch Lauterpacht, and the Polish prosecutor, Raphael Lemkin. And then a fourth man came into the story, Hans Frank, who had been Adolf Hitler's lawyer from 1928 to 1932, 33, and then governor general of uh, occupied Poland from September 39 until February 1945. And he became the fourth man in the book that some of you will have read in German, Rückkehr nach Lemberg, in English, East West Street. And in doing the research for that, I came to meet Hans Frank's son, Nicholas Frank, one of the Frank's five children. And Nicholas and I became very close. This was a curiosity for me because after all, Hans Frank, had been responsible for the killing of my grandfather's entire family in Lemberg and Zulkiew. So it was a surprise that we became friends. Nevertheless, we did. And one day Nicholas said to me, Philippe, since you are interested in Lemberg, where your grandfather is from, perhaps you are interested in the name Otto Wächter. I said, I know the name. He said, yes, he was my father's deputy. He was the governor first of Krakow. Uh, and then of Lemberg in District Galicia. He was an Austrian, not a German. Like Frank, he was a lawyer. And Nicholas said to me, you know, I've come to know his son, Horst Wächter, 
uh, perhaps you would like to meet the son. I said, why not? And a few weeks later, Nicholas Frank and Philippe Sands traveled to Austria and we spent two days in the company of Horst Wächter, a very lovely man, very genial, but unlike Nick, with a very different view of his father. Nicholas detests his father. The first time I met Nicholas, who was hanged in Nuremberg's courtroom 600 for crimes against humanity and war crimes, Nicholas said to me, you know, Philippe, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. And then he said, Horst is different. Horst's father, Otto, was involved in the same crimes as my father, but Horst has decided to find the good in his father. And indeed, that was how it was. I was fascinated by Horst because unlike Nicholas, he did indeed look for the good in his father. He was not a denier of the crimes that happened. He was not a racist. He was not an anti-Semite. This is Horst that I'm talking about. And he accepted that millions of people were killed, Jews and Poles and Roma and many others. But he said, my father was not responsible. He was not a criminal. And so began a journey that has lasted, I think, eight and a half years. And the book, Die Ratten Linie, which is now out this week in German, is the product of those meetings. And we went through a number of stages. The first stage was I wrote a piece, an article for the Financial Times newspaper, uh, which came with the title, My Father, the Good Nazi. And it was a profile of Horst, the son. Then we turned the profile into a film. Rebecca mentioned it, My Nazi Legacy. And that was a BBC film, which in fact was shown at festivals and even in cinemas in London and New York and various places. And then the um, film was touched on in my book, Rückkehr nach Lemberg. And at around this time, something happened that was unexpected. When we were making the film actually in Lemberg in, 19, uh, in 2014, there was a moment where I was interviewing Nicholas about Horst. And in the course of the conversation, Nicholas said, you know what, Philippe, I think Horst could be a new type of Nazi. And I said, I disagreed. I didn't think that was correct. But the exchange between me and Nicholas made it into the film. And Horst saw the film, late 2014, early 2015, and did not like the scene. And he said to me, I'm not a Nazi, Philippe. And I said, I know you're not a Nazi, Horst. And he said, how can I prove that I'm not a Nazi? Which is sort of an interesting question at many different levels. I thought about his question. And eventually I said, you know what? You've shown me little pieces of the archive from your family, which your mother gathered. You've shown me two or three diary entries. You've shown me some photograph albums and some photographs. You've even shown me a few letters, but I've only seen 12, 15 pages. And you say there are thousands of pages. Why don't you give those pages to a museum? And then people can read the material and form their own view about what your father and your mother, Charlotte, did. And he said, that's a terrific idea. I introduced him to a museum in Washington, DC, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They, through a wonderful curator, Anatol Steck, Austrian, uh, digitized all of the material, 8,677 pages, and uh, took it back to Washington, DC. And then Horst said, would I like a copy? Would you like a copy, Philippe? And I said, sure, I'd love to have a copy. And two weeks later, there arrived in my uh, in-tray in, uh, in, in London, a small USB stick containing this incredible family archive. As I said, nearly 10,000 pages, the diaries of Charlotte Wächter, the letters of Otto Wächter, photographs and thousands of other documents. And I started a research project to work out what really happened to Otto Wächter. Let me pause there and let me invite Katja Riemann to do a first reading of the first extract, the opening pages of the book. Katja, over to you. Yeah. 
Jetzt müssten Sie mich alle hören. Good evening, everybody. Rom, 13. Juli 1949. You have to, to mute your, um, no, Thank you. Der Zustand des Mannes im Bett 9 war ernst. Gequält von hohem Fieber und einem akuten Leberleiden konnte er weder essen noch sich auf die Dinge konzentrieren, die ihn in seinem ehrgeizigen Bestreben über weite Strecken seines Lebens angetrieben haben. Das Krankenblatt am Fußende des Patientenbettes bot nur spärliche Informationen. Am 9. Juli 1949 wird der Kranke namens Reinhard eingeliefert. Das Datum stimmte, der Name nicht. Sein bürgerlicher Name war Wächter. Allerdings hätte die Verwendung dieses Namens die Behörden darauf aufmerksam machen können, dass der Patient ein ranghoher Nazi war und wegen Massenmordes gesucht wurde. Er hatte früher als Stellvertreter von Hans Frank fungiert, dem Generalgouverneur der besetzten polnischen Gebiete, der drei Jahre zuvor wegen der Ermordung von vier Millionen Menschen in Nürnberg gehängt worden war. Auch Wächter war angeklagt wegen Massenmords, der Erschießung und Hinrichtung von mehr als 100.000 Menschen. Das war eine niedrige Schätzung. Reinhard war in Rom, er war auf der Flucht. Wegen Verbrechen gegen die Menschlichkeit und Genozids glaubte er sich von Amerikanern, Polen, Sowjets und Juden gejagt. Er hoffte, es nach Südamerika zu schaffen. Sein Vater war auf dem Krankenblatt als Josef benannt, was korrekt war. Der für seinen Taufnamen vorgesehene Platz war leer. Reinhard benutzte den Namen Alfredo, aber sein bürgerlicher Name war Rolf. Als Beruf des Patienten war Schriftsteller angegeben, was nicht ganz falsch war. Otto Wächter schrieb Briefe an seine Frau und führte ein Tagebuch das allerdings nur wenige Einträge enthielt, die, wie ich, Philipp Sands, erfahren sollte, in einer Kurzschrift oder einem Code verfasst worden war, was ihre Entzifferung erschwerte. Außerdem schrieb er Gedichte. Und kürzlich hatte er sogar, um die tristen Stunden eines ablenkungsbedürftigen Mannes auszufüllen, ein Drehbuch und ein Manifest über die Zukunft Deutschlands verfasst. Letzterem hatte er den Titel Quo Vades Germania gegeben. Als er mächtig und frei gewesen war, hatte der Patient seinen Namen unter Dokumente gesetzt, die Menschen zu Freiwillig erklärten. Sein Name erschien am Fuß wichtiger Briefe und Erlasse. In Wien beendete er die Karrieren von zwei in seiner Universitätslehre. In Krakau genehmigte er die Errichtung des dortigen Ghettos. Ein anderes in Lemberg unterzeichnetes Schriftstück Verbot es Juden zu arbeiten. Es wäre daher treffender gewesen, den Patienten hinsichtlich seiner beruflichen Tätigkeit als Anwalt, Gouverneur oder SS-Gruppenführer zu bezeichnen. In den zurückliegenden vier Jahren hatte ihn hauptsächlich der Versuch beschäftigt, zu überleben. Ein Mann, der sich versteckte und zu entkommen suchte und der glaubte, dass es ihm gelungen sei. Als Alter nannte das Formular 45 Jahre. Tatsächlich war er drei Jahre älter und hatte erst kürzlich seinen Geburtstag gefeiert. Sein Familienstand war mit Ledig angegeben. In Wirklichkeit war er mit Charlotte Bleckmann verheiratet, die er in seinen Briefen als Lotte oder Lo bezeichnete. Sie nannte ihn Hümchen oder Hüm. Das Paar hatte sechs Kinder, obwohl es mehr hätten sein können. Auf dem Krankenblatt fand sich keine Adresse in Rom. Tatsächlich führte der Patient ein Leben im Verborgenen. In einer Mönchszelle im Dachgeschoss des Klosters Vigna Pia, das abseits am Stadtrand nahe einer Biegung des Tiber lag. Er schwamm gern. Das Krankenblatt ließ unerwähnt, dass der Patient von zwei Mönchen, die in Vigna Pia lebten, in das Hospital gebracht worden war. Über seinen Gesundheitszustand 
wurde Folgendes vermerkt. Der Kranke gibt an, dass er seit 1.7. nichts mehr essen konnte, am 2.7. hohes Fieber bekam, am 7.7. eine Gelbsucht auftrat. Der Kranke ist Diabetiker, die klinische Analyse ergibt einen positiven Leberbefund. Akute gelbe Leberatropie. Icterus gravis. Thank you so much, Katja. Thank you, thank you. Um, so with the introduction to the book, you have a hundred clues about a story that I think could not be invented. You begin to understand that I and my wonderful research assistants, uh, all of whom are fluent in German or are German, because obviously I needed a great deal of assistance, were presented with a formidable challenge. 10,000 or so pages of documents describing the entire life of Charlotte Bleckmann Wächter from the moment they met on the 29th of April 1929 until the moment he died on the 13th of July 1949. Because shortly after these events occur, I don't think I'm giving anything away, Otto Wächter died. He died in a Vatican run hospital in Rome, trying to make his way to South America to Argentina on the rat line, the Ratten Linie, the Reich migratory route. Why was he doing that? Well, the book is divided in various parts. When I first came to meet Horst, my interest in what it was in what uh, Otto Wächter had done during the war. He had been a, a lawyer, a law student at the University of Vienna. Uh, he'd started working for the Nazi party in the early 1930s. He had joined the party 10 years earlier. He was virulently anti-Semitic. He'd met an attractive young woman in the spring of 1929, Charlotte Blackman, the daughter of a steel maker from Styria, from Mürzuschlag, and they had married in 1932. In 1934, as a very active Nazi, he was involved, in fact, he led the plot to kill the Austrian Chancellor, Engelbert Dolphus. And he fled uh, Austria for Berlin, where he arrived um, at the end of 1934 via Hungary. And he then joined the SS and by 1937 was working in the office of Heinrich Himmler uh, with Reinhard Heydrich and in the same building uh, as um, Adolf Eichmann. And in 1938, and we'll come back to this, in the second reading, he makes his way back to Vienna. But to go beyond in what happens, after 1938, he accepts a job in the new government in Austria, Ostmark as the, uh, following the Anschluss it was called. Uh, and then in October, 1939, his career really begins to grow. He moves to Krakow as governor of Krakow. He builds the Krakow ghetto. He begins the process of rounding up Jews and Poles and others. He writes in the diaries and his letters to Charlotte at the end of December, 1939, my darling, everything is very wonderful here. Uh, the Vienna Philharmonic has been, von Schirach and other leaders have come to visit, a little local difficulty. Tomorrow, I have to have 50 Poles shot. And it's at this point that I begin to realize the archival material, the letters, the diaries, the correspondence, are totally fascinating because for the first time, we have the complete record tracing the life of a senior Nazi and his relationship with his wife. What did she know? How complicit was she? How involved was she? How supportive was he? In 1942, he is sent by Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler to Krakow, to Lemberg, where he becomes governor of District Galicia. And of course, that is where he connects with my family and the family of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, the inventors of crimes against humanity and genocide. In 44, the Red Army occupies Lemberg. He flees, he goes back to Berlin. He's then posted to Italy. And in Italy, he works for several months with the Republic of Salo, with the remnants of Mussolini's fascist outfit. And then of course, in May 45, the war comes to an end. And what's remarkable about the archive is all of this, is covered by letters from Otto to Charlotte and from Charlotte to Otto. So you can trace 
the entire story of their life through this remarkable period. When I first came to know Horst, I was really only interested in what he did during the war or before the war. But having now got this material, I became even more interested in what happened after the war. And here the story takes a completely different turn and a whole new part of the book opens. By this point, I've become interested in the death of Otto Wächter. And the son, Horst, tells me early on, my father was poisoned. And so that, of course, intrigued me and interested me. So what happened? Well, I'm not gonna give everything away, but let's just say that on the 9th of May, 1945, in a small Austrian town called Mahiapfar, he hooked up with a young Waffen-SS soldier called Burkhard Ratman. Burkhard Hartmann was uh, in his early 20s. He had been fighting in uh, Yugoslavia and in Italy um, as a killer of partisans, of communists, and of Italian villagers. And he too needed to escape. He meets Wächter. Uh, Hartmann knows how to survive in the mountains. They flee, they hide in a place where Hartmann says the British are too stupid and the Americans too lazy to go up in the mountain above 2000 meters. And I remember in the conversations with Horst, the son of Otto and Charlotte, at some point I said to him, tell me about this Burkhard Hartmann. What was he like? Why did he do what he did? What was his relationship like with your father? And Horst looked at me, smiled at me and said, well, Philippe, I can answer all of the, your questions or we could telephone Buko. So I was pretty surprised, I have to say, this is 2016, December, and it did not occur to me that the man who'd saved Otto Wächter in 1945 could still be alive, but he was. And we went to visit him and I describe all of that in the book. They spent three years together in the mountains, incredible, tracing and following and reading about the Nuremberg trial as it is going on through newspapers brought to them every two weeks by Charlotte Wächter, who brings food and clothing and essentially looks after them from a distance. In the summer of 48, he decides to come down from the mountain to make his way to Rome and then to make his way to Argentina. But of course, he never gets there. Let's pause the story for a moment and let me now uh, ask uh, Katya whether she could read the second reading because I want to give you a flavor of who Charlotte Blackman, Charlotte Wächter really was. She's smart, she can write, she can capture an atmosphere, and she has her own political views. We are now in March 1938. The Germans have just entered Austria. Adolf Hitler is coming to Vienna. Over to you, Katja. This is from the personal diaries of Charlotte Wächter. Und so rannte ich mit Dankesbezeugung und frohem Herzen in die Belvedere-Gasse zu den Eltern, wo ich mich sofort an den Apparat schwang und nach all, nachdem alle Leitungen gesperrt waren, ein Blitzgespräch nach Berlin anmeldete. Ich weiß noch, es haben drei Minuten 90 Schillinge gekostet, eine Menge Geld, doch wert der Sache. In ein paar Stunden erreichte ich ihn im Amt des Obergruppenführers Rodenbücher, der die oberste Betreuung aller Flüchtlinge hatte. Nun, er kam ans Telefon. Voll Freude und großem Stolz sagte ich, ich gebe dir hiermit den von Globotschnik erteilten Befehl, sofort und unverzüglich nach Wien zu fahren, um bei dem Einmarsch des Führers dabei sein zu können. Seine unwahrscheinliche Überraschung. Er frug nach und kann das denn wirklich wahr sein? Ich versicherte ihm die Richtigkeit und er hoffte, bald und rechtzeitig nach Wien kommen zu können. Wie glücklich war ich damals, denn ich wusste, dass es wirklich ein Wunder war, ihn erreicht haben zu können. Ich bin überzeugt, dass Globus niemals daran dachte, dass ich am Telefon den Kontakt so schnell bekommen könnte. Tja, vielleicht hatte er es sich überlegt. Ja, und am nächsten Morgen stand er als Brigadeführer in seinem schwarzen SS-Mantel, weißen Aufschlägen und SS-Uniform um 7 Uhr früh an der Eingangstür unserer elterlichen Wohnung in Wien. Er sah trotz der großen Strapazen und Müdigkeit strahlend aus. 
Nun wurde gebadet, Kaffee getrunken, kurz telefoniert und gleich in die Stadt gefahren. Sein Chauffeur war auch bereit. Und was musste es für ein Gefühl gewesen sein, nach vier langen, bangen Jahren wieder die Heimatstadt sehen zu können. Mittags kam er wieder mit zwei Teilnahmekarten am Heldenplatz oben am Balkon. Es blieben nunmehr etliche Stunden bis zum großen Ereignis und so waren wir voller Erwartung. Am 13. März 1938 fuhren wir schon bald in die Stadt mit dem großen Mercedes und forschten nach unseren Freunden und nach dem zugewiesenen Platz. Fischböcks, Leas und andere waren alle mit uns. Plötzlich hörte man ein lautes, entferntes Rufen und Schreien, bis dieser Ausbruch der überwältigten Freude des Rufes Heil Hitler immer näher kam. Wie ein wogendes Menschenmeer rauschte es stets näher und stärker und der Weg am Heldenplatz, der von Menschenmassen, die Kopf an Kopf standen, ganz ausgefüllt war, bis zum Rathaus, Ballhausplatz und herum wurde nun ganz langsam und schwer freigehalten. Der Führer stand mit erhobener Hand und grüßte die begeisternd tobende Menge. Es war ein spontan und aus dem Herzen kommender Ausbruch der Freude. Denn alle wurden von dem Gefühl der aus dem Herzen kommenden Freude mitgerissen. Seit Inquate und Frau und noch viele andere kamen mit dem Führer, der langsam die Treppe über die Hofburg am Balkon hinaufschritt. Er stand einen Meter vor mir und ich konnte ihn gut sehen und hören. Nach einer Begrüßungsansprache begann er seine Rede. Er als Österreicher war tief gerührt und konnte es vielleicht selbst kaum fassen. Thank, thank you, Katja. And of course, one of the things that's wonderful about your reading is you've captured her voice. How do I know that? The reason we know that is that unbelievably in the archive which Horst so generously gave to the museum in Washington and to me are 14 cassette tapes. Because as she recorded her memories in the 70s and in the 80s, Charlotte Wächter died in 1985, she would record her meetings with various of Otto's old colleagues in trying to reconstruct the wonders of his life. So we know what, um, Uh, she sounded like and Katya you've really uh, captured him and can I just say here rather publicly Katya how wonderful it is that you've done the audio book with my dear friend Stephen Fry uh, the, the three of us have combined and that has been an incredible pleasure and I'm happy to tell you that we've just decided this week that the book which will come out in the United States in February in 2021 they're going to use the same recording they love the recording so you will not only be in the Anglo world of Britain and Ireland and Australia, but you will be the, uh, the audio book in the United States also, which is great news. Again, in this text, there are clues, clues about Charlotte, clues about Otto, clues about who they knew, Globochnik, the man who constructed all the worst camps, the extermination camps on the territory of Poland, Treblinka, Sobibor, Majdanek, Belzec, all the work of Odilo, Globochnik and Seis Inkvad, the first governor of Nazi occupied Austria. Arthur Seis Inkvad, later governor of Holland, one of the reasons the book, it seems, became a bestseller in Holland. Arthur Seis Inkvad was Horst Wächter's godfather. And remarkably, still today, Horst sleeps with a photograph of Arthur Seis Inkvad next to his bed, despite the fact that Arthur Seis Inkvad was sentenced to death in courtroom 600 and hanged just a little after Hans Frank. Let, let me ask you, uh, Katja, what are your feelings about Charlotte Wächter? I'm fascinated for her. For me, she is the beating heart of the book because for the first time we have an account in her own words of the partner of a, a Nazi who literally sat at the top table. What's your sense of her? In a way, what you described about um, Vestas, the, you know, the couple, could also be 
um, called a love story. You know, so they, was, they, they loved each other dearly. And in a way, so the idea of how a Nazi couple should look like doesn't fit in a way because they loved each other so dearly and they were protecting each other. And she was his greatest supporter. I don't know, maybe I should, I'm, I'm quite unsure, Rebecca, if I should, soll ich Deutsch sprechen oder Englisch? Ich weiß es jetzt gerade nicht. I'm sorry, shall I speak English or German, Philippe? Oh, I cannot hear you. Someone should tell me. Speak, speak in German. Speak in German. Yes? Yeah, in German, in Deutsch. Yeah, okay. Entschuldigen Sie bitte die Verwirrung. Um, also, das hat man ja vielleicht bislang verstanden. Ich glaube, das ist um, interessant zu sehen, wie sehr sie diesen Mann unterstützt hat. Uh, mit ihrer Liebe und mit ihren Aktionen. Und sie hat, ist ja auch diejenige gewesen, die ihn dann nach Österreich geholt hat mit ihrer Vehemenz. Und sie war eine glühende Nationalsozialistin. Und das hat sie auch nach Ende des Krieges, im Gegensatz zu vielen anderen, niemals anders ähm, kommentiert. Und das ist vielleicht, at this point, I have to switch back to English again, to, forgive me. At, at this point, it could be interesting uh, to talk about uh, the situation that when the American allies arrived in Austria, that she was actually admitting that she was truly believing in the national socialism, that she was a Nazi and they were quite, I like that bit a lot because the Americans said, well, we were driving through Germany and Austria, we never met a, a single Nazi. And, and she was convinced and, she, and that day she was still convinced and many decades after this. So, and, and, and how do you deal with someone who's very educated, very vocal, very loving to her husband and her family, but being a Nazi? So, and this is in a way intriguing, I, I guess. This is confusing also. This for me is very interesting. Um, so in the, in the reviews in the English papers, and they've been very positive, I've been very lucky. Nevertheless, a number of people evoked and in the conversations that I've had, why they ask me, why do I never describe Wächter or his wife as monsters? Because they were. The answer is because they were not monsters. That is not an accurate description. Wächter did monstrous things. He did criminal things, but he was also capable, as was his wife, of great humanity, of love, of culture, they were great. She in particular loved going to Salzburg, loved going to Bayreuth, always went to the opera, loved to sit in the Gauleiter's box. Uh, they were both readers. They were both interested in ideas. His book, um, Quo Vad, his articles, Quo Vadis Germania, indicate a, a highly intelligent, highly cultured, highly educated human being. And this, of course, is the big mystery that fascinates me. How could such people get involved in such horrors? This for me is the very big question. And of course it raises further complexities. Unlike Hans Frank, who was tried in courtroom 600, sponsoring this event, Wächter got away. He was never caught. And although he was indicted for mass murder, crimes against humanity and genocide, more than 100,000 people, actually probably more than 500,000 people, he was not caught, he was not tried, he was not convicted. And so Horst, the son says to me, but Philippe, on your own logic, when my father died in 1949, he was an innocent man. He was not a criminal. He had not been convicted by a trial. And that creates a space and Charlotte seized on that space. And she then passed that space to her son Horst, who has reconstructed a narrative within his family for himself, not everyone supports that narrative, that his father was essentially a decent man. Let's take the story a little bit further to the next stage. He makes his way to Rome, and here the material becomes, for me, complex and even more extraordinary. Because what I had not realized was that in April 1949, when he arrived in Rome, he entered a nest of spies. You could be in a spy thriller. In fact, we are in a spy thriller. And because of the letters that passed between them, even still in this period, and the diaries, 
we're able to reconstruct all of the people that he met, who helped him, how they helped him, where he lived, how he got a job. Unbelievably, he even got work because he needed money working as a film extra in Chine Chitta. It's, you literally could not invent it. But let me just pause here and say something about method. We had 8,677 pages of documents, almost all in German. So we went through the exercise of translating, of course, what we needed into English. And I wrote the book in English. There were a number of complexities. In their letters, particularly in 1949, they wrote in code. They never used the names of the people Otto was meeting. Charlotte never wrote to him about the names of the people who were helping him. So for example, when he arrives in Rome on the 29th of April, 1949, he sends a letter straight away to Charlotte and says, wonderful darling, I've met um, the religious gentleman. And the religious gentleman helps him, gets him uh, a room in a monastery, the Vigna Pia, as Katya read, and helps him get a bit of money and helps him get some contacts and helps him to try to get work. But he never mentions the identity of the religious gentleman. And that became a real challenge. So we had four years of detective work to work out who every person was that he wrote about in the letters and the diaries and who Charlotte wrote about. And we identified with precision every single person and could work out the names, the identities. And we discovered an absolutely extraordinary story, a nest of spies into which he fell. Let me pause also on another aspect of method. And that is the translation. I would just like to pay testimony to my extraordinary German translator, Thomas Bertram. A lesser translator might have said, oh, okay, Philippe, you've written the book in English. I will just translate your English back into German. No, Thomas wanted to see the original material. So we had to go through the exercise of going back to Charlotte and Otto's original diaries and letters and making sure that the version you are reading in German is not a retranslation of a translation of the original German, but the original German. This is a hugely time consuming exercise, as you can imagine. And I really want to thank Thomas Bertram and also Fischer Verlag for the incredible work uh, in doing that. Let's go back to 1949. And let's just uh, imagine the world that he has entered, a world in which Vatican officials, former Nazis, SS officers, Italian fascists are helping Otto Wächter. And I ask myself, what on earth is going on? I have many aspects of my life which are very fortunate. One is that one of my neighbors is a writer of spy novels from this period. You know him as John le Carré. And for 20 years, my job has been to review the uh, manuscripts of, his real name is David Cornwell, actually. I call him David, but David is John le Carré. I, he asks me to review his manuscripts because in each of his manuscripts, there are always lawyers. And my job with his manuscripts is to check that the lawyers sound like lawyers, speak like lawyers, dress like lawyers, act like lawyers. And so I've integrated, I think over 20 years, his style of writing. Anyway, I fell across this material from 1949 and I said to myself, I know nothing about espionage. I know nothing about the Cold War. I will go and ask David Cornwall, John le Carré, could he help me understand what is going on? Katya, if you could, our third reading, please. Herr Silschein, in gewisser Hinsicht war ich ein winziger Teil jener Welt, der Wächter begegnet. Die Worte überraschten mich. Der sie sprach, war mein Nachbar, David Cornwell, besser bekannt als John Le Carré, Autor von Romanen über Spionage während des Kalten Krieges. Ich hatte mich an ihn gewandt, um Einblicke in die von den CIC-Akten geschilderte Welt zu bekommen. Ein Thema, von dem ich annahm, dass er einiges darüber wusste. 
Es begann mit einer Nachricht, die ich ihm schickte und auf seine Nachfrage überließ ich ihm ein wenig Hintergrundmaterial über Otto und Charlotte und ein paar der freigegebenen CIA-Akten über Lauterbach. Er lud mich zum Tee ein, ich erschien mit sechs Törtchen, einer Handvoll Briefe von Otto, einigen Fotos. Wir saßen im Wohnzimmer, während Sonnenlicht über die Papiere flutete, die auf dem Sofa und einem niedrigen Tisch ausgebreitet lagen. David hatte sich auf kleinen Karten Notizen zu dem Material gemacht. Er erklärte, warum ihn die Sache interessierte, erzählte mir, dass er 1949 sogar in Österreich gewesen sei. Etwas, das ich nicht gewusst hatte, während seines Wehrdienstes, als er in Graz stationiert war. Als junger Leutnant war er einer Einheit der Field Security Section zugeteilt, einer Art geheimdienstlicher Militärpolizei, die sich für die russische Zone interessierte. Wir setzten kleine Agenten ein, junge Burschen auf Motorrädern, die russischen Posten Pornobildchen verkauften. Solche Sachen, sagte er. Angeblich waren wir auch Nazi-Jäger, durchkämpften Displaced Persons Lager, befragten massenweise Flüchtlinge, ein erbärmliches Geschäft. Ich schrieb darüber in ein blendender Spion, A Perfect Spy, der ganz von dieser Zeit inspiriert ist. Er schlug vor, mal einen Blick in das Buch zu werfen, da es auch eine ziemlich komische Zeit gewesen sei. Ich tat es irgendwann und fand die folgenden Worte, gesprochen von der Hauptfigur des Romans Magnus Time. Sind Sie ein Spion? Und wenn ja, würden Sie dann nicht lieber für uns spionieren? Oder sind Sie nur ein Verbrecher, in welchem Falle es Ihnen sicher lieber wäre, in die Spionage einzusteigen, als von der österreichischen Polizei über die Grenze abgeschoben zu werden? Ja, es war nicht schwer, sich vorzustellen, dass Otto, solche Fragen gestellt wurden. Pimes und Davids Erfahrung stimmte mit dem überein, worauf ich auf der Spur von Ottos Kontakten in Rom gestoßen war. Viele durchliefen Internierungs- oder Kriegsgefangenenlager, oft mit falschen Identitäten. Sie wurden verhört, flohen, wurden gefasst, flohen erneut. Einige brachten sich mit unerlaubten Mitteln in Sicherheit, andere wurden angeworben. Otto starb. Die Möglichkeit, dass David eine von Ottos Kontaktpersonen verhört haben könnte, amüsierte uns. Eine kleine Welt, eine, die sich zwischen Ottos zweitem Verschwinden im Mai 1945 und seinem ersten Begräbnis im Juli 1949 dramatisch veränderte. Ein wegen Massenmords gesuchter ranghoher Nazi, dann nur vier Jahre später ein potenzieller Verbündeter gegen die Sowjets. Italien und Österreich, so erfuhr ich, standen im Zentrum der Auseinandersetzung zwischen Ost und West und David war dort gewesen. Wenn seine Einheit eine gesuchte Person als möglichen Rekruten identifizierte, tauchten Fragen auf. Aber man wurde irre, erzählte er. Ich war mit einem Hass auf den Narzissmus und diese Sachen großgezogen worden. Und dann, Knall auf Fall, festzustellen, dass wir in Sekundenschnelle eine Kehrtwende vollzogen hatten und der große neue Feind nun die Sowjetunion sein sollte. Es war sehr verwirrend. An seine Gruppe wurden von unterschiedlichen Organisationen Fälle übertragen, weil Informationen über mutmaßliche Nazis die Runde machten, spielte das CIC eine zentrale Rolle. Doch spätestens 1949 ähm, erlahmte das amerikanische und britische Interesse an der Strafverfolgung von Nazis rapide. Und die neue Zielvorgabe lautete, die Wertvollen zu benutzen, sie aus Europa herauszuschaffen, vielleicht in die USA oder heimlich nach Südamerika zu bringen. Die Amerikaner wussten von der Raffinerie. Sie halfen vielleicht sogar. Sie halfen vielleicht sogar, sie einzurichten, bestätigte David. Er wusste, dass es eine Fluchtroute gab und nannte die Zahl von 10.000 Ex-Nazis, die sich nach Südamerika absetzten, oft mit der Hilfe des Vatikans. Eine Zeit, in der geneigte Verkäufer auf geneigte Käufer trafen. 
wie er es ausdrückte. Theron in Argentinien sagte, bitte kommt hierher, wir sind Faschisten, die Nürnberger Prozesse sind eine Chance. So as you can imagine, dear Katja, this was a bit of a shock to me because I assumed that Otto Wächter, indicted for mass murder, indicted for crimes against humanity and genocide, hunted by the Americans, the Soviets, the British, the Poles, the Jews, and a myriad of others, was on the run. And he too believed himself to be on the run. But he arrives in Rome and he finds himself without fully appreciating it, a nest of spies. On the weekend of the 2nd and 3rd of July, 1949, he goes to visit an old comrade, an SS officer. I won't give too much away here. He never gives the names in the letters. We now know the name. And something happens. 10 days later, he is dead. Horst believes that he was poisoned by this man who killed him. This SS officer, it turns out, was indeed an agent of the Americans. And what is remarkable, what seems to me unimaginable, was that Otto Wächter arrived in Rome, in a city and in a place, to be greeted by a group of people who were all spies for the Americans. Within half an hour of Wächter arriving in Rome, the Americans who were hunting him knew he had arrived and knew he was called Alfredo Reinhardt and where he was living. And what happened next for me is fascinating. I, I won't go into that now. I'll leave that hanging. Just before we finish, Katya, as you read that part of the story, what was your reaction? Because for me, as an English French person, I'm a dual national, the idea as David Cornwall, John le Carre says, we had been brought up as children and young teenagers to be told that the Nazis were the worst of the worst. And now all of a sudden they were our friends and we were recruiting them. For me, that was a shock. How was it for you when you first read about that? Well, we shouldn't forget that so many things were just possible because so many people and nations were in the entire thing. You know, shouldn't forget this. And um, in my opinion, it is so. Maybe I should tell us that my family on my mother's side was killed um, by the Nazis and for other reasons. And um, or oh, they hanged themselves. So, um, but I think the 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 general idea that um, Nazis were monsters. This is that makes them so less dangerous because then it's then it's a demon and a monster. And this is something like coming from a, I don't know, from, from a fairy tale. But these people were real and they were smart. And this is why we really have to, to, to look back that we can look at what is happening right now everywhere in the world, you know? And, and being German myself, like coming from this, from, history, from this history, we really have to, to, to see what is happening um, in this society, you know, what kind of tendencies are, 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 you know, are getting into it and getting in a way normal. What is happening in the East part, not just of Germany, but of Europe, what's happening over there in Turkey or in the States or in England. So um, it, it, it seems that the, for me, that's just my, thoughts that the search and rescue, so, so the beginning of the so-called refugee crisis, which is not a crisis, which is, which is, a, which is a circumstance uh, relating to the war in Syria, which is still going on, that this in a way was the impulse giving moment for so many um, uh, countries and societies and governments to go, you know, to move themselves into the right, right wing um, part. And I think um, the reason why we really have to look backwards to know and to educate us is to, to, to be aware when, it, when is the moment where we really have to be alert because then we can still make a change. And this is, you know, this is why I do my humanitarian work. 
um, because we have to take things serious. Um, yeah, that's that would be my comment. Great. Well, thank you, Katja. Uh, Rebecca, I think now is probably a time to take a few questions, is it not? Um, hopefully you can translate them into English. <laughs> that will be all right. Vielen herzlichen Dank für diese spannende Buchvorstellung. Ich bin mir ganz sicher, dass das mehr Lust auf das Buch gemacht hat und viele werden bestimmt in diese spannende Geschichte eintauchen. Ich würde Sie jetzt gerne alle noch mal einladen, Ihre Fragen in den Chat zu schreiben. Ein paar sind schon eingegangen, aber ich nehme mir natürlich einfach mal die Freiheit heraus und stelle die erste Frage. Philipp, this first question goes to you. Um, the story of Otto Wächter is a fascinating story of an alleged war criminal escaping justice. Of course, there were so many more. Um, would you consider his story to be a representative example of what made arrest of an alleged war criminal so difficult, or is his story much more unique? Well, I mean, I think every story is unique, but I suspect there were others like him who the Americans and the British had their eye on because a new enemy had come into the picture and the new enemy was the Soviets, the communists, the Bolsheviks. And that is what caused in Italy in particular, um, the Vatican, some people in the Vatican, Italian fascists, old Nazis and the Americans to come together in the combat. And I think that is similar, but one mustn't forget a couple of things. Firstly, Otto Wächter was a top table Nazi, as we would say in English. He wasn't some middle ranking person. This was someone, all, every single one of his colleagues at his level were either caught, con tried, convicted and hanged, or they committed suicide. None survived. And that is what would have happened to him if he had been caught in that early stage. But there's another aspect of this question that's interesting to me. What about Horst? And is Horst the more regular kind of story where you, as a child, want to find the good in your father, an honorable thing to do, but in so doing enter really a world of denial and negation? Because as you've read the book, Rebecca, you've seen, I come up with very hard evidence. I come up with photographs of his father overseeing the execution of innocent Poles. He was certainly a criminal. He would certainly have been convicted if he had ever been uh, caught and tried, but he wasn't. And that creates a space. And into that space, Horst is able to insert himself and create a narrative of innocence and of decency. And of course, that is a much more common story because the Hans Frank type of stories, that was the exception. People who were caught and tried, most people weren't. Uh, and most people got away with it. And that allows family narratives to be told. But it's a very important question. My second question comes directly from our audience and basically connects back to what you just said. Um, and that is based on your relationship to Horst von Wächter. I mean, you base your interesting book on a historical treasure, the diaries and all the documents yeah. you got from his mother, Charlotte. And um, the question is how did you come by this extraordinary historical treasure? I mean, a lot of it must have depended on your relationship with Horst von Wächter and how is this relationship now after the publication of the book? Well, you know, I mean, I have a number of jobs. I, apart from writing books, I, I work as a lawyer in court and I've learned that you respect people, even if you disagree with them, you speak courteously to them and you behave honorably. And so Horst and I have remained in touch for 10 years. Um, despite our different interpretations on the facts, we like each other. Um, I think right now he's not so happy with the attention that the book is getting. Um, and I know he writes quite a lot of angry emails to people um, and suggests that I have not given an accurate account. Um, but I always write back to him and I say, well, you know, what's inaccurate? Show me the other material that I've left out. You know, to give you an example, it, it, I looked through, we went through everything, literally everything, and anything which would have shown that he provided assistance to Poles or to Jews, or that he had any regrets about what he did, I would have put in the book, but there is literally not a word there, nor from Charlotte. They were absolute true believers in the project. And so I think I've behaved 
correctly. I've, it's a very balanced book. I give Horst the opportunity to make his case and make his argument, uh, perhaps in a way that's even slightly repetitive, uh, some people have suggested, but that was the only way to treat him fairly. So I'm very comfortable that I've acted very correctly. We are in touch. We email each other about once a week. Um, and he shares his ideas with me, things he likes, things he doesn't like. Uh, he's offered to have a conversation. In fact, I've suggested to you, Rebecca, uh, that we might have that conversation together in courtroom 600. We did it once three or four years ago, and I'm hoping that we might have one more shot with Nicholas and with Horst to visit courtroom 600 and talk about these issues. But my relationship, you know, it's not always easy, but it's essentially a trusting uh, relationship. And um, I'm very lucky that he gave me this material and I felt that I needed to respect the spirit in which he gave me the material. But the reality is we fundamentally disagree on the interpretation of the material. He thinks his dad's a good guy. I think his dad was a mass murderer. I'm not gonna give anything away, but towards the end of the book, the next generation comes into the story and the story takes a very unexpected turn. For those of you who are interested in this and who have good English, with the BBC, we made a podcast series called The Rat Line, which you can find if you just Google the BBC, The Rat Line. Katya did some of the readings uh, on that. On the day the final episode 10 was broadcast, I received a totally unexpected email from Horst Wächter's daughter, Magdalena. And the end of the book deals with the consequences of that email. Uh, it takes us in another direction. Life is very unexpected, you know, Rebecca, very, very unexpected. Thank you so much, Philippe. My next question goes out to Katja Riemann. Um, <laughs> ganz überrascht. Katja, warum haben Sie sich entschieden, ausgerechnet dieses Buchprojekt mit Ihrer Kunst zu unterstützen? Oh, vielen Dank für die Frage. Um, Philippe und ich, wir sind nun seit, how long is it, Philippe, that we are friends? When have we five, five years. Five years. Yeah, not just friends, we perform together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so haben wir uns kennengelernt, weil um, er einen Abend uh, komponiert hat, sozusagen aus seinem ersten Buch East West Street, worüber vorhin schon gesprochen wurde, was in Deutschland dann unter dem Namen uh, Rückkehr nach Lemberg veröffentlicht wurde. Und um, ich darf vielleicht ganz uh, stolz sagen, dass ich das vermitteln konnte an meinen uh, Verlag Fischer. Ähm, und da seitdem, also seit fünf Jahren, touren wir eigentlich durch, diese ganz, durch die ganze Welt mit diesem, mit diesem Arm, wo noch zwei französische Musiker dabei sind. Und so war es eigentlich, hm, wie soll man sagen, führte eins zum anderen, ja, weil nun Philipp jemanden brauchte, der äh, Charlotte liest, ähm, mit einem deutschen oder österreichischen äh, Akzent im Englischen, hat er dann gesagt, na, da kann ich auch Katja fragen, das ist zwar dann nicht österreichisch oder so, aber wir kennen uns, wir vertrauen uns und sie kennt meine Arbeit, so habe ich das zumindest verstanden und es war quasi ein weiterer Schritt in einer Zusammenarbeit ähm, für, für seiner, seiner Werke. Ja. Alles klar, vielen herzlichen Dank. Ähm, ich lese noch eine weitere Frage vor, die direkt aus unserem Publikum kommt. Um, the question goes out to you, Philippe. Um, in your research, in your preparations, what surprised you the most? Oh, there are so many surprises. Um, I mean, I never expected to find myself with 10,000 pages of documents. I mean, for those of you who are watching this, when, when the, book, the book came out in English early May and uh, and then in Holland, and then it came out in French. And by October, Horst was getting a little bit frustrated. And he then really did surprise me. He wrote to the Holocaust Museum in Washington and said, look, Sands has not accurately described the material. I want all the material to be put on the website of the Holocaust Museum. <laughs> okay, so any of you can now just Google search it. You can type in Holocaust Museum, Wächter Archive, and you can look at all of the material for yourself. And it's incredible material. One of the things that's not on there yet are the tape recordings. And these are absolutely incredible. For example, 
Here is one recording from 1977, where Charlotta, who has spent a number of years tracking down some of her husband's old colleagues, finds a journalist called Melita Wiedemann, who had been the editor of a highly Nazi uh, magazine. And they meet in the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich, and she records the whole conversation. It's fantastic. And you can hear, you know, they're eating and they're drinking and they're knocking glasses together. And at a certain moment, Charlotte says to Melita, this is 1977, those really were the good old days. And Melita says, absolutely. And Charlotte says, I was a true Nazi, you know. And Melita says, yes, so was I. And then one of them says, and I think it's Charlotte, do you know what? I still am. <laughs> and you get a sense of the looking back on the glory days. And it's the authenticity of the material, the letters, the diaries. It's incredible. You feel, I have to say, you feel a bit voyeuristic. I feel a little uncomfortable that you're going in on this material. But it is the rawness, the authenticity of the material, which is so striking. August 1942, Otto's writing to her from Lemberg about the Juden Aktionen and sending hundreds of thousands of people back to the righteous slave labor. And she writes back her letters saying, yes, it's marvelous here too. I'm on the Schmittenhoer, the children and I are halfway up the mountain. We're bathing naked in these lakes. The sun is shining, the nature is so beautiful. It's the disconnect between the brutality and the horror and the mundanity and beauty of everyday life. This is what is so, I must say, in answer to your question, so surprising and actually so, so very shocking. Thank you so much. One more question from our audience. Why was Argentina such a, an attractive destination for high-ranking Nazis? And what would have become of Otto Wächter if he ever made it there? Well, that is a very good question. We know what happened to some of the people who went there on the rat line first. Uh, Mr. Mengele and Mr. Eichmann. Um, one was not caught, the other was caught. Let's say there's a community of willing helpers out there. Uh, I've just started writing the third book in the series, uh, and this will take me to South America. Why? Um, and I'm beginning to understand the life that Wächter would have had in Chile or Argentina. When Otto Wächter arrived in Rome in April 1949, the religious gentleman who I can share it was the well-known Bishop Alois Judal, uh, found him a place to live in the Vigna Pia Monastery. And he lived in a monk's cell. He occupied the cell which had recently been vacated by one of his old comrades, an SS officer called Walter Rauf. Walter Rauf uh, fled from Rome to Syria, from where he wrote letters to Otto. We've got the letters. And uh, Rauf basically says to Otto, well, Syria is not a good place for Germans. They're too disorganized. Go to South Africa or go to Argentina. You'll be much better there. Ralph himself leaves Syria, goes first to Ecuador, spends five years in Ecuador, and then in 1955 arrives in Chile and lives and works as a small businessman until 1973, when it is said he joined the intelligence services of General Pinochet after the coup in Chile. And we have, or I have, a, an affidavit written by a young Chilean writer in 1990, describing his act of interrogation and torture at the hands of a man, he was blindfolded, the young writer, described, who he described as being Walter Rauf, the former comrade of Otto Wächter. And the third book, will explore what happened. And this becomes personal to me because in 1998, eight years after that affidavit, I was in London when Augusto Pinochet was arrested in London for crimes against humanity and genocide. And I was invited to work for uh, Augusto Pinochet in the legal proceedings in London. 
my wife said to me, Philippe, if you act for Augusto Pinochet, I will divorce you. So I didn't act for Augusto Pinochet, but I did act on the other side against Augusto Pinochet. And I will tell the story of what happened in London and the story of Walter Rauf. Walter Rauf, incidentally, has a number of claims to fame, but one of them is he is credited as being the inventor of the mobile gas chamber. He also provided testimony that was used in the um, courtroom that we can see behind you, Rebecca. And finally, last but not least, he also worked for the West German intelligence services in the 1950s, like many of these people. So it's a pretty filthy world out there. That is what we learned. That is a surprise also. Thank you. And we have time for one last question coming from our audience. Um, one person states that coming to terms with the past in Austria is quite a different story than here in Germany. And he suspects, she suspects that there are many people in Austria like Horst von Wächter. And she asks you, um, what is supposed to be done to make a difference in that situation? Well, that's a really important question. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it honestly, not diplomatically. Um, Nicholas Frank is German and Horst Wächter is Austrian. Katja, you've met both of them. I think their different nationalities is one of the factors that plays in to their different attitudes. It's not the only factor. They came from different families. I think Nick's family was less loving. Horst's family was more loving and closer as a family. Um, but I think the national identity issue does play a role. Um, I want to be very clear, though, I've had incredible assistance from scholars, young and old, in Austria and in Germany alike, and I'm hugely grateful for that. I am very, very comfortable in Germany. I, I come often uh, and I feel completely at home in Germany. The legacy of the past in relation to my own family, it's there, but it's the past. Austria, I don't feel quite so comfortable. And it's changing. I'm, I think the new generation is really now beginning to engage. And one of the things I'm looking forward to is the reaction to this book in Austria, which so far has been pretty positive. Um, and I was supposed to be in Vienna these weeks. Now we've put it off until April of next year. But plainly, there is a, something to be said about the differences in Germany and Austria. And of course, Austria for many decades treated itself as the first victims of Nazism. But in the room behind you, a very significant number of the defendants were Austrians. And one of them who should have been there, but was never caught, was Otto Wächter. The Austrians, I think, that I write about were very fully implicated. And I think that affects the story. Thank you so much. Tatsächlich bringt das auch unsere digitale Buchvorstellung schon zum Ende. Ich bedanke mich noch einmal ganz herzlich bei Katja Riemann und Philipp Sands. Wie schon zu Beginn angesprochen, ist diese Veranstaltung Teil gewesen unserer unterschiedlichen Projekte zum 75. Jahrestag. Es gab noch weitere Veranstaltungen und unterschiedlichste Formate, die wir hierzu ausprobiert haben. Wir stellen gleich noch einmal unseren Link zu unserer eigens dafür ähm, ja, ausgearbeiteten Webseite online. Da können Sie sich dann gerne auch noch mal unsere anderen Formate ansehen, unter anderem auch den Erinnerungsakt, an dem Philipp Sands am 20. November 2020 auch anwesend war. Ein weiteres Projekt ist gerade noch in unserer, in unserer Pipeline, ein Ausstellungsprojekt, das Schülerinnen und Schüler hauptsächlich mit durchgeführt haben. Sie haben sich mit dem Erbe der Nürnberger Prozesse ähm, beschäftigt und was das heute noch für sie bedeutet und ihre Ideen und Erfahrungen dann auf Graffitis übersetzt. Diese Graffitis werden wir in einer Wechselausstellung zeigen. Dafür gibt es leider noch kein Eröffnungsdatum. Das können wir natürlich erst machen, wenn unser Haus auch wieder geöffnet ist. Ansonsten teilen wir Ihnen auch gleich noch einmal den Link mit, wo Sie das Buch von Philipp Sands im Fischer Verlag bestellen können. Es ist aber auch so ähm, in vielen unterschiedlichen Büchereien und äh, Bookshops erhältlich. 
Ansonsten sage ich auch noch einmal vielen Dank an Sie alle, dass Sie sich bereit erklärt haben, zu unserem ersten digitalen Format so eifrig dabei zu sein. Und ich würde sagen, wir versuchen das Ganze jetzt noch einmal ein bisschen zu öffnen und unseren Dank auch noch mal an Katja Riemann und Philipp Sands auszudrücken. Ich würde Sie jetzt einladen, dass Sie alle einmal Ihr Mikro anmachen und einen kleinen Applaus ganz Corona-sicher geben. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Thank you and thank you, Katja, and thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, everybody. Ich habe du musst hier drücken. Was? Das, ist, du, du, du drückst, das bringt gar nichts. Du musst hier drücken. Ich kann nicht hier drücken beim nee, Mac. Aber, ja, aber auch ja, jetzt hier nicht. Ja, okay, gut. Unten steht verlassen recht.